Modern-day Turkey is a fascinating mix of bustling, crowded cities and rich, fertile agricultural areas where grapes flourish under blue skies. Its people are hard-working and friendly to strangers. Tourists come here seeking a taste of biblical history or to roam the sites of cities that once dominated the landscape of ancient Anatolia. The Apostle John spent his latter years on a rocky outcrop not far from the western shores of this vast land, about twice the size of Texas. He wrote to the fledgling Christians in seven major centers. Many were struggling with persecution and discouragement under Roman oppression. Today, we visit the site of ancient Laodicea and discover these letters from a lonely isle. We've come to the city of Istanbul and to the Grand Bazaar on the trail of a series of letters sent to this part of the world, then called Asia Minor. It was a letter sent by a great physician offering a cure for what ails the soul. And what he tells people who've sunk into the spiritual doldrums is to go on a shopping spree, a very special kind of shopping spree. Today we'll discover what kind of goods can rescue us all. It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible. Still relevant in today's complex world. It is written. Sharing hope around the globe. Presented by Mark Finley. Shopping Spree Remedy. In the book of Revelation, we find this series of messages sent by Jesus Christ, recorded by the Apostle John here on the island of Patmos. John had a vision from Jesus himself while he was a prisoner of the Roman Empire. These letters were addressed to seven churches in the western part of what is now Turkey. The last letter came to the city of Laodicea. There is not much of it left today, but Laodicea must have been quite a city. It was an important trade and banking center in Asia Minor. The city became so wealthy that when it was destroyed by an earthquake in 60 AD, its citizens refused Roman help and rebuilt it out of their own resources. The letter in Revelation sent by John to this prosperous city arrived here when it was in the process of rebuilding. The city wouldn't become a ruin until later when the Ottoman Turks destroyed it in the 13th century. I'm sitting here on an ancient Roman aqueduct in Hierapolis across the valley from Laodicea. We're going to take a close look at what this letter said because it deals with a spiritual problem, a soul ailment that afflicts almost all of us at one time or another. It's found in the third chapter of Revelation. The letter begins with Christ's diagnosis of the problem. This is what the great physician observes in Laodicea, in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 15 and 16. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Jesus Christ uses a metaphor to describe a spiritual problem, lukewarm water, water that's neither hot nor cold. It's not hot enough to provide a good bath, and it's not cold enough to be good drinking water. It's something that nauseates you. What's the doctor talking about? Complacency, indifference. The Laodiceans weren't hot. They didn't have a spiritual fire in their bellies. They didn't have a passion for knowing God. But they weren't cold either. They hadn't rejected God. They weren't exploring the alternative. They were lukewarm. They had just enough spiritual life to make them comfortable, but not enough to move them anywhere. They couldn't be inspired as saints. They couldn't be converted as sinners. This water really is lukewarm. There was a reason Jesus chose the metaphor of lukewarm water. The city of Laodicea had no local water supply, no clear bubbling brook, 
no hot springs. Water had to be brought in by means of an aqueduct. A rival city nearby, however, had a source of water that had made it famous all over Asia Minor. It was a place called Hierapolis, often visited by the citizens of Laodicea. Hierapolis boasted a series of thermal springs with unusual mineral deposits. You can even see them today. The water here, saturated with calcium salts, left white deposits as it flowed down the slopes. These uniquely shaped deposits are called travertines. Today, the place is called Pamakali, which means cotton castle, and it's a very popular tourist destination. Hierapolis became something of a health spa in ancient times. People with all kinds of ailments flocked to these mineral springs looking for a cure. There seemed to be something magical about the place. What the hot, soothing waters of Hierapolis seemed to offer the afflicted was a taste of heaven. Boy, this is really warm. It really feels good. This is an amazing amphitheater here at Laodicea. On a hot summer evening, over 20,000 people would crowd in to come to a play or listen to a concert. They could look across the valley and see Hierapolis, where there are thermal springs. Water coming from a place like that here to Laodicea by aqueduct wouldn't stay hot. The seemingly miraculous mineral water turned into something lukewarm you wanted to spit out of your mouth. And water from a clear, cold spring, as it flowed by aqueduct in the heat of the sun, would lose its refreshing temperature as well. Neither hot nor cold. The believers in Laodicea had become comfortable and complacent. They didn't really think they needed a visit from the divine doctor. And so Christ had to use a striking image to try to wake them up, to get them to see their ailment, their true condition. He said, you think everything's just fine, but really you've become something I want to spit out of my mouth. Give me hot, give me cold. Give me something I can work with, but please, don't give me lukewarm indifference. And in Revelation chapter 3, we can see that Jesus went a little deeper with his diagnosis. He defined the ailment even further. Look at verse 17. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I am rich and have need of nothing? That's how the Laodiceans felt. That's what they were saying to themselves. Evidently, Christians in the city were part of the general prosperity. They weren't being discriminated against. They weren't suffering persecution. That was good news. But the Laodiceans also weren't excited about the gospel. It didn't move them. The good news of Jesus Christ had become old news. Materialism was starting to dull their spiritual senses. The busyness of everyday life was starting to neutralize their spiritual values. At first glance, being comfortable doesn't seem like such a bad thing. Certainly not a dangerous thing. What's wrong with having your needs met? What's wrong with being financially secure? What's wrong with being happy with what you've got? The answer is nothing at all, except when you're poor, blind, and naked, and you don't even know it. The problem comes when you're starving inside, but you think you're full. It comes when you're blind inside, but you think you see. To understand the crisis these people in Laodicea faced, let me take you to what was one of the most comfortable places in the world, one of the most self-sufficient environments on earth. This is the Topkapi Palace in Istanbul, where the sultans of the vast Ottoman Empire ruled for centuries. They were all powerful. Their wealth was legendary. Everything they touched was gilded or jeweled. The sultans wore magnificent silken robes once and then threw them away. A state banquet would require 50 different dishes served on a table of solid silver. Deep within the palace, through one inner courtyard after another, lay the royal harem. Hundreds of beautiful women were pampered and primped, waiting to be summoned for the Sultan's pleasure. Here we are in the inner rooms of the Sultan's harem. 
In a spectacularly comfortable place like this, there were many rivals to the throne, many struggles over power. One sultan slept in a different chamber of the palace every night to avoid assassination. And royal gold often proved thicker even than blood. Family members conspired against each other. It became a law in the Ottoman Empire that when a new sultan came to the throne, all his brothers had to be killed. This bloody practice finally produced outrage when one sultan had even his infant brothers done away with. Officials decided it would be better to keep royal siblings locked up. They were kept in a suite of rooms above the harem, which came to be called the Gilded Cage. Some were kept there all their lives. They did have the luxuries of a royal palace. They had servants at their beck and call. All their creature comforts were supplied. They had need of nothing. And also, there was a chance that they could become sultan if their brother on the throne should die. But something happened to those boys growing into men in the gilded cage. Something happened to them in their comfortable isolation. They lost their bearings. They lost their identity. They lost, above all, their compassion. Deli Ibrahim was made sultan after 22 years in the gilded cage. He suffered from extreme paranoia and once had 200 concubines drowned in the Bosphorus. Another man who emerged from the gilded cage, Osman II, sometimes used prisoners of war as living archery targets. When a prince named Mustafa emerged from 14 years there, he was totally demented. The great majority of sultans who came out of the gilded cage were ineffective, corrupt, or mad. They were swallowed up by palace intrigues. They had a hard time dealing with problems beyond their luxurious palace. Many actually came to be dominated by the bored, scheming women in their harem. And the Ottoman Empire, the empire that had spread all around the Mediterranean, the empire that had once threatened the heart of Europe itself, began to shrink. It began to decay. It eventually would just fade away. That's what can happen to us when we get too complacent, when we're neither hot nor cold. The very thing we cherish can slip through our fingers. The faith and values we've based our lives on can start to fade away. There's a danger in that gilded cage. There's a danger in coming to think we have need of nothing. We can end up poor and blind and naked because our spiritual life has slipped away when we weren't looking. That's the problem the great physician diagnoses in his letter to the church at Laodicea. This is a particularly important letter because Laodicea, the seventh church, represents the church of today. It completes God's description of his people throughout history. The word Laodicea means a people judged. This church is the church living just before the coming of Jesus. It's the church facing the judgment hour. Unfortunately, Laodiceans are lukewarm or complacent, indifferent. Living in the most exciting time in the history of the world, they fail to grasp the urgency of the moment. They fail to understand the significance of the hour. Christ's last church, Laodicea, stands poised on the verge of eternity, yet she sleeps comfortably in lukewarm complacency. She lives in Earth's final hours, but fails to recognize the significance of the time she's living in. Christ stands knocking on the door of Laodicea's heart. He appeals to her to awaken, to commit her life to him, to seize the opportunity of the moment, to proclaim his word and prepare the world for his soon return. So what does he recommend as a cure for Laodicea's ills? What can we do about being lukewarm personally in our own Christian lives? Can we really reverse that slow, steady decline? Well, this great physician does offer a remedy. What he tells us, surprisingly enough, is to go out and buy three things. These are excellent. They're, they're gorgeous. Now a shopping spree is not the first thing that comes to mind when we think of spiritual remedies. Even if we use a trip to the mall or a bazaar to cure the blues. But the great physician has a very special kind of shopping in mind. A special shopping excursion designed for those who think that they have need of nothing. This golden wheat is about ready to harvest here in the fields of Laodicea. 
It reminds me of Christ's final judgment and Christ's final harvest. It also reminds me of a prescription that Jesus Christ himself gave in chapter 3 of the book of Revelation in verse 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. This is the prescription for those who are poor and naked and blind and don't know it. This is a prescription for the lukewarm. It shows us a way out of spiritual lethargy. It shows us how sleeping souls can be revived. So these goods Jesus asks us to purchase must be powerful remedies indeed. They must be potent. Let's look at exactly what the great physician meant by this gold. These white garments and this ISAB. Jesus says, first of all, buy from me gold refined in the fire. What does that mean? Well, we find a very similar phrase in another part of the New Testament. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 7. The apostle prays for believers that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter relates the testing of faith to gold being refined in a fire. And he adds that faith is even more valuable than gold because it doesn't perish. In other words, Peter is saying that faith is a priceless quality that's worth developing. It's worth refining. And that's what Jesus is urging the complacent to buy. Invest in faith. Invest in trust. When we're feeling very complacent and self-satisfied, when we're surrounded by material comforts, it's easy to start thinking of faith as something very intangible. There's so much that's tangible, so much that we have of prosperity and material blessings that we may think that we don't need faith very much. We stop stretching beyond the human to the divine. We stop stretching beyond safe boundaries. We stop taking risks, risks in prayer, risks in Bible study, risks for God, risks to deepen our spiritual life. But Jesus is saying, wake up. You're desperately poor without faith. It isn't ethereal. Faith is as solid as gold. It's as tangible as the treasures people haggle over at Istanbul's Grand Bazaar. It's more important than any gilded treasure we might purchase and place in our homes. We can spend our lives in the pursuit of flashy trinkets of one kind or another. But the most important things in life will slip through our fingers unless we invest in faith, in making a present connection with God. How do you rise out of spiritual lethargy? First, take a step in faith. Stretch past your comfortable boundaries. Take on a new challenge in the name of Jesus. Now let's look at the second thing the great physician prescribes, white garments. We need to clothe our nakedness in white garments. What does that mean? This same image appears in Revelation chapter 7. John describes a glorious scene in heaven. A huge group of redeemed individuals are excitingly praising God. And John sees that they're all wearing white robes. Someone explains in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 14. These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. In the New Testament, white garments are a symbol of righteousness, of right standing with God. These garments are made white by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. In other words, sinful human beings are declared righteous when they accept what Jesus did on the cross for them, when they accept his perfect life poured out for them as an atonement for sin. That's how we're justified before a holy God. That's how we can be declared righteous before a holy God. So what Jesus is telling the complacent is to buy this white garment to cover their nakedness. The lukewarm have forgotten the glorious good news. They have forgotten how desperately they need a savior. They have forgotten the price of our rescue from the tragedy of sin. We lose our energy in the spiritual life. We become lukewarm when we forget how we're justified before God. It starts to seem abstract and distant. But what Jesus tells us is that this gospel is as basic as clothing. 
as basic as the shirt on our backs. We're naked and in need of covering. The white garment that Jesus offers us from the cross is essential for our security. How do you rise out of spiritual lethargy? Appreciate this costly gift. Stop taking it for granted. Realize how desperately you need the grace that comes to us from the cross. Now let's look at one more thing the great physician prescribes. He urges the complacent to also get some ISAV, to anoint your eyes with ISAV that you may see. What's this referring to? In the New Testament, it's the Holy Spirit who is most commonly referred to as the one who opens human eyes, who helps us understand. Jesus himself made this promise to his followers in John chapter 16 and verse 13. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. It's the Spirit who enlightens. It's the Spirit who convicts. Jesus is telling the complacent, you need the Holy Spirit. You need to be enlightened by the Holy Spirit. You think you see, but you're really blind. It's easy to develop blind spots when we're comfortable. It's easy to tell ourselves little lies and get away with it. And when we think we have need of nothing, it's easy to think of the Holy Spirit as an accessory. What Jesus is saying is that the Holy Spirit is as necessary as seeing. He's part of the essential remedy for our souls, more important than any ointment we may run across in an exotic bazaar, more important than any medicine that promises us perfect vision. The Holy Spirit is the one who can get us to see inside of our own hearts. That's the prescription from the great physician, a prescription for spiritual lethargy. We have to realize that faith is as solid as gold. We have to appreciate the fact that Christ's saving act is as basic as clothing. And we have to know that the Holy Spirit is as necessary as seeing. These are the goods that will awaken us and energize our souls. Christ's remedy is more powerful than anything the people of Asia Minor found when they came here to Hierapolis. It's more potent than anything in these mineral waters. Christ's remedy penetrates into the depths of our soul. And there's one more wonderful fact that you need to know about Christ's prescription. We find Jesus' remedy here among the ruins at Laodicea. Listen to the end of his message to the church at Laodicea, found in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him, and he with me. Here's good news indeed. This physician makes house calls. He doesn't just advertise his great prescription. He brings it to us. He's standing at our door. He's knocking. It's as if this healer could bring an entire health spa right to our door. He brings the goods that'll cure us. He brings the gold, the white raiment, the eye salve to our doorstep. Isn't it time that you opened that door? Isn't it time you sat down and had a talk with Jesus? Isn't it time that you had a meal of fellowship with him? That you spent time with him? You've invested your life in so many other things. How about investing in the relationship that counts the most? The relationship that can energize your sleepy soul. Christ is waiting. Christ is knocking, just as the spring rains have watered the hills of Laodicea today. Jesus will water our own souls if we'll only let him. Right now, as Jesus stands at the door of your heart knocking, it's up to you to invite him in. Will you do that? Will you make that commitment to him? Will you let him bring you that spiritual life that deep down inside you're longing for? Why not do that right now as we pray? Dear Father, we come to you because a spiritual slumber has overtaken us, because we've lost that fire in our belly, and so we want to take that first step of faith right now. We need your gold for our poverty. We need your white garment for our nakedness. We need your eye salve for our blindness. And so we open wide the door of our hearts right now. Please come in. Please make yourself at home. 
please make yourself our Savior. Oh, my Father, enter our hearts, change our lives, transform us, and make us over again right now. We pray thee in Jesus' name. Amen. We all want answers to life's questions. We all need comfort and encouragement for our spiritual journeys. We're all looking for hope for the future. We're all together on the same planet with the same basic human needs. And God has direction for each of our lives. A good place to start your own spiritual journey is the It Is Written website at www.itiswritten.com. Here you'll find resources to enhance your walk with Christ. Go to the studies page and explore the Bible in three free online Bible studies. View weekly It Is Written programs through streaming online video. Catch up on shows you may have missed in the telecast archive section. View the scriptures used in the current week's program. Print out the script from a show you liked for future reference. Find out about upcoming programs and see when and on what channel It Is Written is airing in your city. Go behind the scenes and get a feel for the It Is Written production process. Be the first to find out when an event with Mark Finley or other live It Is Written programs are coming to your hometown. Get the latest It Is Written ministry news and developments. Learn more about the ministry and read the history of the show that's been impacting our world for God since 1956. It Is Written is a donor-supported nonprofit ministry. On the website, you can sign up to become an It Is Written partner and make a secure online donation to help us fulfill the Great Commission. Visit the It Is Written store and find pages of spiritual resources like videos, DVDs, audio tapes, books, music, Bible studies, and digital media products. Be confident in buying online with our secure ordering system. Have a prayer request? There's a place where you can tell us your concerns. There's so much here for you on the It Is Written website. We encourage you to make it a frequent companion on your spiritual journey. Get connected to the source that can change your world, starting with you. Thank you for joining us on this journey to the sites of the seven churches of Revelation. These messages still speak to us today. They speak of faith and confidence in God. I hope that your own prayer life is deepened that your own commitment to Christ is deepened as you've taken this journey with us. I hope that God has spoken to you about personal problems in your life and you've discovered Him as the solution to those problems. And so from the lonely Isle of Patmos, we say goodbye. Until next time, remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God.